Hi, and welcome to the last day of our June session of the Summer of Savor Golden Celebration Series. My name is Chanel Zapata, and I will be your host for today. We want to thank our partners, Major League Baseball and Baseball Reference, for their support. We're thrilled to discuss international baseball from the prominence of the sport globally to the upcoming Olympics that will be celebrated in Tokyo, Japan. A couple of housekeeping items. We will be using the Q&A function if you want to ask our panelists any questions. Also, you can enable the closed captioning by clicking on live transcript. On a final note, this meeting is being recorded and will be shared after the conclusion of our event. Joining us in our first session, we where we will discuss the Caribbean Winter Leagues and the post-pandemic Latin American baseball, we have Leonte Landino. Leonte serves as the chair of Savers Luis Castro Latin American chapter and is a member of the BBWAA. Landino is the lead baseball content producer for ESPN Deportes and ESPN International. He has covered baseball in the US and Latin America since 1996. Our next guest is Enrique Rojas. Enrique is a reporter for ESPN Deportes covering Major League Baseball and the Winter Leagues across all the network's platforms. With more than 20 years of journalistic experience, his reports on MLB breaking news have had an international impact. He's a member of the Baseball Writers Association of America and has covered numerous MLB All-Star Games, the World Series, the World Baseball Classic, the Caribbean World Series, as well as the 2004 Olympic Games and the 2003 Pan American, Pan -American Games. Leon de Enrique, please take it away. Thank you, thank you, Chanel. Um, well, welcome everybody. Welcome, uh, welcome to our little uh, space of conversation of uh, international baseball. I'm gonna share my screen, Enrique is there too. So we're thrilled to be here with you guys, uh, um, you know, this afternoon to talk a little bit about um, what we like about um, international baseball. Let me see, you see it, right? You see my screen, la ve Enrique. Okay. Um, if you if you unmute your your mic, it would be better. <laughs> <laughs> now it's better. I I, I can okay. I can watch the, the okay. letters. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. So um so um let's talk a little bit about the state of uh, Caribbean Winter Leagues. Uh, I mean, it was great uh, for for Saber. We're thrilled and honored from uh, you know to to get this invitation to talk a little bit about. Um, how is the what's happening in the Caribbean Winter Leagues, uh, especially in this uh, pandemic scenario? Uh, what's happening after the pandemic? Uh, we can't really say that that we have a post-pandemic uh, scenario, but but you know the soon to be. What's going to happen after, and what's happening right now, and uh, what's happening in this in this process, which has been really challenged. Uh, challenging for uh, for Latin American baseball and for winter baseball, which is a very passionate uh, topic, and you know we can spend here hours talking about winter baseball. Um, like uh, Chanel was saying, talking uh, just a little briefing about us. Uh, we're glad to have Enrique here. Honored, Enrique is a national baseball correspondent for ESPN Deportes.com. He's uh, one of our TV reporters and analysts on ESPN Deportes and International. He's a Hall of Fame voter. Uh, as a member of the Baseball Writers Association of America, and he covers baseball since 1991. I'm not gonna say his age. Um, and uh, like uh, Chanel was saying, uh, uh, I'm a, I still serve as a content uh, producer and writer for ESPN Deportes and ESPN International. Uh, I'm honored to continue being the chair for the Saber Luis Castro chapter, uh, where uh, we've try to encourage and and, uh, and, uh, and create the awareness of Sabre in Latin America. Um, I'm a member of the Baseball Writers Association of America and I'm, I covered uh, this exciting game since 1996 and joining ESPN in 2005. So let's talk a little bit about what's happening in today's Latin baseball. Um, last Caribbean series was hosted by Mexico. Um, uh, in last February, we had the Caribbean series in Mazatlan, where Aguila Cibaeñas from the Dominican Republic won the sixth Caribbean title. Um, very exciting for, for Aguila Cibaeñas, a great baseball organization, one of the best baseball organizations outside of Major League Baseball. 
So a uh, great achievement for them to be winning the Caribbean series once again. Um, the schedules uh, were shortened in overall in, uh, in, in winter ball due to the pandemic. No fans were in attendance except in Mexico where uh, there, was, there was some limited capacity. And uh, obviously the cancellation of ma minor league baseball and uh, the vanishment, the, the vanishing of, of minor league baseball in 2020 uh, forced uh, several high-end prospects to, to join the winter teams, just like uh, Wander Franco, which uh, he uh, finally had his major league debut, Julio Rodriguez, who won the Olympic berth uh, with uh, the Dominican Republic in the, this week um, uh, as well, one of the high uh, top prospects of the Seattle Mariners. And high caliber players were forced to complete game time, like Gary Sanchez or Domingo Germán or Renato Núñez or William Astudillo, who played in Venezuela in the Dominican Republic in Mexico because they needed they needed some of that of that time. So basically, around it was a little bit of a benefit for for winter ball to uh, to have that short major league baseball season and no minor league baseball season because some of these uh, prospect ha prospects needed the, the the game time. So um, so that was a little bit beneficial for for the winter ball. So I want to go with Enrique uh, going through a little bit of like the scenario. You forget, you forget, Leonte, Fernando Tatis Jr. and Robinson cannot play too in the Dominican League, in the Dominican Winter League for for most of the season, the pandemic was the, the center uh, of fears in the Dominican Republic, not only for healthy reasons, for baseball, sports reasons, but for the Winter League in the Dominican Republic was amazing season, short season, a lot of stuff, Jaciel Pui too coming from USA to play in the Dominican Republic and another stars in cierto sentido was just amazing season. Uh, we have it in, in the Dominican Republic because the pandemic is crazy, but for the pandemic, the Dominican Republic have it maybe the best, the best season in a long time in the island because everybody wants to play. Everybody need to play the veterans, the rookies, major leaguers, people from Asia. The Dominican Republic have a great, great season and everybody show can watch that in the Caribbean series, the Aguilas one. Correct, um, exactly, that's, that's precisely the point. So I wanna go with you a little bit over the scenarios of the different countries and kind of like, you know, tell what's, what's happening. In each of the in each of the main baseball scenarios in Latin America, so I want to start with Venezuela, where, uh, as you can see, the picture there, a uh, picture there is a Caribes de Anzuategui, uh, a team owned by Magli Ordonez, uh, who was the champion in Venezuela and went to uh, represent Venezuela in the Caribbean Series. So the season in Venezuela in 2020, 2021 uh, was playing in the bubble. They created two divisions uh, in, as most of you know, Venezuela has eight teams. So they created two divisions, four teams each, and they were playing each in two bubbles. And at the end of, of the season, they were, uh, they had a, a, a round robin. So one of the big issues in Venezuela is that the MLB restrictions are still in place from OFAC the Office of uh, Foreign Assets and Controls of the United States, especially around two teams in Venezuela, Tigres de Aragua and Magallanes, Navegantes del Magallanes. Those two teams are um, under uh, restrictions of MLB and the OFAC that they cannot get or sign any players under any contract with an MLB organization, just because these two teams are are not privately um, owned, are owned by uh, foundations that are dependent directly of government, pretty much funding. So, as you know, the uh, the government of uh, Nicolas Maduro has been uh, 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 punished by the United States with uh, with um, 
all of these restrictions, um, you know, uh, in, in political, the, the, the whole political scenario of the, uh, of, of, of the United States and, and Venezuelan government, it's also affecting the, the baseball scenario. So pretty much the whole right now, the whole league in Venezuela, which is the biggest problem than even the pandemic. So on top of, on top of the pandemic that uh, the, the humanitarian crisis in Venezuela, uh, it's obviously affecting baseball more and more. Um, currently, and there's limited flights, but during the season, there were no international flights in or out of Venezuela, which made impossible for players to either Venezuelan players or foreign players to actually go to Venezuela and play. Um, there's a huge disparities in salaries. Uh, there were players making just barely $100 per month, and some other players are making over five figures. So the disparities in the in the salaries are, are huge just because some players are well-known players that some of these teams need they 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 have the need to play to keep the the show going um there's no visas for u.s players uh so that makes very very difficult to to have american players to uh go and play in venezuela just like for the la like it has happened for the last 60 years uh we have there's a lot of players flocking into other leagues looking for jobs for example, there's a lot of Venezuelan players playing in Colombia League, in the Colombian League, Venezuelan players playing in the Mexican League. But these players have to be out of contract and they have to be totally released from their home team because they cannot play anywhere they want just because of a contract, because they are part of a winter baseball, well, because they're part of the winter baseball agreement where they need to have the permission from their home team to join another team from another country. And obviously, as part of MLB movement, there's a, a lack of MLB scouting continues. The scouts from MLB that live outside of Venezuela, they cannot get into the country. They cannot fly into the country. There's no visas. There's no flights. So obviously, this whole restriction will affect the flow of Venezuelan players into the MLB system. Enrique, how do you see right now what's happening in Venezuela? What's the scenario? And how do you foresee uh, the future of Venezuelan baseball from your perspective? Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I will explain in Spanish. You, you can say it in English for no confuse. Una cosa es todo lo que está pasando políticamente en Venezuela. One thing is the political reasons. Another thing is the coronavirus, the pandemic, economic, the whole region. En Venezuela tienen muchos problemas hace mucho tiempo y todos están relacionados a una situación político-social que afecta cada extracto del país. Y la pandemia simplemente lo que ha hecho es empeorar una situación que ya estaba eh, en un caos. En un caos que es parte del caos general que está viviendo el país. El béisbol, que es tan importante, el béisbol es too much important for the Venezuelan people, for the country, for the everybody. El béisbol vivía en una burbuja de la realidad que pasaba en Venezuela. Pero el coronavirus hizo que el béisbol sintiera más que nunca la realidad general del país. Y es asombroso, it's amazing for me, Venezuela pudiera jugar last year, economic, no flights, no dollars, they need dollars for pay, not only for foreigners players, for a lot of Venezuelan players too, because they live in USA. They don't have a dollars, they don't have a, a include sometimes, they don't have a supply, for the hotels, for pro baseball, for professional players, and they have a lot of problems. It's a struggling for well, the I, last maybe 10 years, no? Of course, of course, and I agree with you. So pretty much be, basically what you're saying is that we all are facing this pandemic state and pretty much what happened in Venezuela is that you know, on top of the pandemic, the pandemic came to Venezuela pretty much to make it worse. 
to worsen the whole scenario, especially in baseball. Uh, the whole, you know, on top of the humanitarian crisis, on, on top of the political crisis, on top of the health crisis, the economical crisis. So on top of that, you get the pandemic. So it makes it even worse. So obviously the issues in Venezuela are, are bigger um, and, and, and obviously that's affecting baseball. That's going to affect baseball in the future. Um, it's, it's really sad, like you're saying, that, that there's a need of, of, uh, the, to have a healthy baseball. Venezuela had a, a really healthy baseball industry. Uh, and I would say, like, with, with what uh, the league reach in the mid nineties, in the beginning of the, of the century, the, the league reached a very, very high level of professionalism because of the amount of Venezuelan players in, in MLB. So all of these players, some of these stars and some of these players that are not regulars in MLB or they have the experience in MLB, they can come down to Venezuela and they increase the level of the league. So because it's a national, it's a national sport, there's also a um, good investment on it uh, by companies, by private entities and uh, uh, good media exposure. So the baseball industry was really healthy with everything that is happening, everything has come down. So you, most of you might, might, might ask yourself, so why they keep playing? What's, what's happening there? And the, the, the main reason is that the government needs to continue to have some sort of like in what they said in Venezuela, pan y circo, bread and circus. So they really need, they, they're really in the need, or they believe that there's a need of keep playing a show where they provide the population that still that is still in Venezuela some sort of like public entertainment. And baseball it's serves that purpose. In USA, they say the baseball is a national pastime, but uh, we don't know. I don't know if it's the, the really the national pastime right now because the baseball fight against NFL, NBA, NHL, MLS, whatever. In Venezuela, in the Dominican Republic, the baseball is the national pastime for sure. No fight with any sports, any entertainment, no, 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 no. Baseball in Venezuela and Dominican Republic and Cuba and a lot of places, but for Venezuela, the baseball is like a religion. It's not a sports, it's not national pastime. It's a religion, it's over the church, the government, the politic, over everything on top. And then everybody tried to, to stay in, in, in normally in baseball. The, the country is struggling, economic is struggling, everything is struggling, but baseball stayed like in the own bubble in the last, in the last five or six years, okay? Every, we think, we think, nosotros pensábamos hace cinco o seis años, que Venezuela no iba a poder tener un torneo de béisbol. They don't have a baseball in Venezuela. But uh, they have a baseball, they celebrate baseball, they have a champion, and everybody forget about the struggling in the country, only for baseball. Y el año pasado se agrega la pandemia del coronavirus y uno pensó, ahora sí, será poco probable no tener béisbol en Venezuela. Y volvimos a tener béisbol en Venezuela, volvieron a celebrar un campeonato, volvieron a coronar un campeón, volvieron a participar en la Serie del Caribe. It's like in Venezuela, the baseball is, está blindado para crisis. Que el béisbol se esté jugando actualmente en Venezuela, para mí, es amazing. Es asombroso, León. Yes, of course, I agree. It's a miracle for them to be, <laughs> for them to keep playing baseball. So moving on, let's talk about the Dominican Republic. Obviously, the Dominican Republic has uh, um, gained pretty much a, be a better approach 
from the pandemic, even though the one thing that we can't really deny is that the league is improving the quality every year, along with the marketing and nationwide awareness, like Enrique is saying in the Dominican Republic, it's really a national pastime. I mean, there's no fighting for with anything else. Uh, once the baseball season starts in October, October, November, December, there's nothing else happening in the country. You know, it goes beyond politics. It goes it goes beyond any crisis, any any you know any holiday. You know, baseball. It's 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 uh, what what people is, is talking in the streets and talking in in the media and everything. Uh, last year, the sanitary restrictions uh, affected a little bit the planning. Um, and this year, the, they're planning to allow 30% capacity of the league starting in uh, October 27. They're planning to start the league this season, and they're planning also to bring the capacity up to 60%, even though there's a big hit of the uh, COVID-19 right now in the Dominican Republic. Uh, they're planning a 40-game regular season and a round-robin playoff of four teams and a finals of the base of se best of seven. And right now, one of the biggest and hottest topics is that even though with all the pandemic going on and all the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the high rates of COVID happening in the Dominican Republic, they are being the host of the Caribbean series. And there's high criticisms of why we should be talking about having an international tournament right now when we need to take care about um, uh, the COVID itself about the pandemic. So, uh, what's going to happen, Enrique? What do you think they are ready right now? I mean, we, there's no doubt that the 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 quality of Dominican baseball. I think Dominican baseball right now, the Dominican baseball league, is the best league in the world outside of Major League Baseball and the Japanese league. Outside of those two, right now, Dominican baseball is the best league in the world. But do you think they're ready to get the Caribbean Series next year as an international tournament and get people and tourists and, and all that stuff? Are, are they ready to go? I hope because the Dominican Republic do a great job handling the pandemic. It's right right now the capital city, Santo Domingo, have a big concern about coronavirus, but the Dominican Republic banks than USA, banks than Euro country have a, around the half a country uh, vaccination, la vacuna para el coronavirus. In the Dominican Republic, we are ready for two doses. It's the, the first country in the world is talking about two doses for COVID uh, pandemic for the, for the people. Uh, we have a a great, great program de vacunación. Se está moviendo en eso. Yo creo que el país paró todo, cerró todo y convirtió todo en una gran crisis para poder manejar la pandemia. Y los beneficios de manejar bien la pandemia se van a ver en el futuro, incluyendo in the next Dominican Winter League season, we'll be short for 10 games, only 40 per team. Uh, is 50 in normal situation. Uh, I, I think we, the Dominican Republic will have good tournament and the Caribbean series because the Dominican way is dejar todo para lo último. O sea, <laughs> República Dominicana. You leave it all so, so, so everybody can understand like the Dominican way is I'm gonna leave everything to last. I'm gonna. <laughs> to last. To last. We need to, we need to dejar todo para lo último. No podemos planear, no podemos uh, hacer grandes proyectos que vayan con una ruta que se vea eh, paso por paso. No, no, no. The Dominican way is everything at the last time in Harvey. Pero yo creo, I think everything will be, will be good in the Dominican, not only for the Dominican winter board, but two for the Caribbean series in February in Estadio Quisqueya. Everything so will Dominican, be ready, Leon. The, Dominic the Dominican protocol is no protocols, so just so you know. Uh, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about Mexico, uh, the Mexican Pacific League. Uh, let's focus on, on the Mexican Pacific League. As most of you know, Mexico has two, two leagues. 
the Summer League, the, the Liga Mexi Mexicana de Baseball, the Mexican Baseball League, and the Mexican Pacific Winter League. Uh, just in terms of, 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 of the Summer League that is right now happening, the biggest change right now is that after the minor league season, the, after the whole uh, uh, re-engineering of, of minor league baseball that now belongs to MLB, and the minor leagues, as we knew from the last 150 years, doesn't exist anymore. So the Mexican league used to belong into the minor league system. It was an independent league with a triple A category, and it was part of the minor league season. It was part of minor league baseball, uh, even though it was independent. So they acted like that. That's an agreement from the 40s, the 50s, uh, when they joined the National Association of professional baseball leagues and starting this year they're not considered they they broke mlb broke all ties with the summer league and now they're just an independent mexican foreign league um it doesn't have a now it doesn't have any more that triple a uh rate i would say the ranking uh and that's the league that it's playing that it's being played right now where you see highlights of Bartolo Colon playing there, and you see highlights of Yasiel Puig playing in Veracruz or Omar Vizquel managing the Toros de Tijuana, um, which obviously with all the pandemic and uh, and and I think I think more than the pandemic, the the Mexican league has it's benefiting as they should have for many years of all the players that doesn't fit into MLB. I would I call them I call these players the the four A's, okay? The the, the yes. quadruple or the quadruple A's. Like if you have a player that doesn't fit in your triple A team, but you don't want to pay, the, the, it's it's a good enough player to be in the major leagues, but you don't have you don't have you're not gonna spend so much money for the X for this player, then you know there's when the, the Mexican league comes and say like okay I want this this player. That's a case of Yasiel Puig. That's a case of Addison Russell. Who's playing their uh, uh, um, great defense for uh, Acereros de Monclova team? So these kind of players are 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 getting are giving a good spectacle. But Bar Bartolo Colon is pitching in the in the Mexican Winter League he's right now. Great, <laughs> he's pitching great. Um, he he drove complete game last week at 48 years old. Bartolo is close to 50 years. He's pitching well. In Mexico, hitting maybe one MLB team open the eyes. And now, Rick, let me ask you about Bartolo Colon. Do you think, like in the 80s, now this is something that just came to my mind. Do you think, like, well, based on today's baseball, Bartolo Colon doesn't have a contract in MLB? But do you think if, if we go back to 1985, do you think if in 1985 Bartolo Colon would have a baseball contract right now in MLB? But Bartolo in in eighty five. Yes, if we're right now in nineteen eighty five, if right now is nineteen eighty five, you think Bartolo Colon will have a job in MLB? Uh, no, I don't think so. No, no, no. Okay, I, I know the people say the, the the baseball is younger and younger every year after year. No, but if you have a talent, if you call Nelson Cruz, the people stay contract. If you call Nelson Cruz, the people stay contra because I think the baseball is not spend the money anymore in name, but in stats. You know, if you are hitting, if you are pitching good, you are receiving one contract every year, one contract for one year, not not ten years, not five years. I don't think so. If he, Bartolo Colon will pitch in 90, in 85, but he's trying to be back to MLB. He's pitching in Mexico because he thinks he can pitch in MLB. Yes. He's exactly. looking for pitching MLB. Exactly. All right, so don't get surprised. So talking about the, the Mexican Pacific League, um, they are establishing as the most solid winter league. When I say the most solid is in terms of marketing, money, organization, 
just like Enrique was saying, the Dominican way, the Dominic, the Dominican level, it's way high, but the Dominican way, it's not to have any preparations or protocols. Everything is taken to last. In Mexico, things have been way more organized in the last few years. Uh, they were able to expand the league into 10 teams and even make something that was unthinkable many years ago, which is bringing, allowing one of the teams, one of the professional franchises in Mexico to have a double participation in the summer league and in the winter league, which is the Sultanes de Monterrey. The Monterrey Sultans are playing in both, in both leagues for the first time ever and with different players because the players that are under contract for the summer they can be playing for Monterrey in, in some other teams in the winter, and they have to build a new team for uh, the winter time. So um, it's a really new way of thinking. I like what they uh, what I, I like that they they are willing to try new things, and they're taking the lead in uh, in Latin America in organization and marketing and in these type of initiatives. So. Um, they have, uh, as a result, they have more organized uh, offices. They have more organized um, baseball structures. Um, they have new ballparks, most of the teams. Um, one, the, the best ballparks in Latin America right now in Mexico. Um, and this year, they're thinking that the regular season is going to start even in October 8th. They're going to go back to the regular 62 games calendar. After the summer league gave up the idea, well, last year the summer league wanted the idea to kind of like overlap with the winter league, and they wanted to make two uh, two tournaments during the year. So they finally got into the same page, and and they gave up that idea. So October eighth is going to be their start, the their start uh, of the season. They're going to expand into four, five foreign active players per roster. So that gonna that gonna bring a little bit more. Uh, that's gonna bring a little bit more of uh, international attention. Uh, you're gonna you're gonna see more um, high quality uh, MLB caliber player players in the winter in Mexico. Maybe some Venezuelan high caliber players that are not able to play in Venezuela playing in uh, playing in Mexico. And the dual citizenship uh, dual citizenship players, uh, uh, Mexican Americans, are playing as uh, as Mexican as native. So they don't count in towards towards uh, uh, those uh, five uh, uh, player cap. Um, like I'm saying, the, the league has new upgraded venues. They have aggressive marketing and expanded uh, revenue source uh, sources of revenues. Um, Enrico, what do you think it's a, it has been the key for Mexico for the success? Based Business. based that in in, tw in tw twenty years ago, the Mexican Pacific League was was a, a very uh, small and didn't have the quality to even compete with Dominican, Puerto Rico, and Venezuela. And the, their growth is amazing. It's business. The uh, Venezuela, Dominican, Puerto Rico, maybe, oh, but Dominican and Venezuela, they have players. Mexico have a business, businessmen. They build new ballpark. park. They have a marketing. They get the fans to the stadium, more people in the stadium every year for the last 10 years. Maybe Venezuela before have a, a lot of people in the stands. In the Dominican, you need to, to win for the people go to the bar park. The Dominican don't go to the bar park only for like a USA or Mexico, only for enjoy the night. No, no, you need to, to win. You need to be, say, Tigers, Aguilas y Baeñas. You need to win. And in Mexico, they understand the, the whole process in the business. They don't have the players. They don't have the big stars in MLB. Anywhere, the, 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 the best players in Dominican and Venezuela not play in the Winter League, but we have a, a lot of players some play in the Winter League. In Mexico, the kid is business. They are doing great jobs in business. They don't have the big stars. They don't have Fernando Tatis, Romel Acuna, Jose Altuve, Black Guerrero, blah, blah, blah. But uh, they have guys doing great jobs in office, especially with the stadium. 
It's amazing Mexico have a new stadium in the whole city, in the Winter League, see, in, in the Winter League ball. It's amazing. For the Dominican Republic, it's amazing. For Venezuela, think about Venezuela, think about the Dominican Republic, don't have it. One big stadium, really for MLB games, World Baseball Classic, whatever. Mexico have a, maybe six or seven ready right now. For me, it's no baseball matter. It's business matter. They are doing great jobs in business and maybe will be better in the field. They are doing max in the field in the last 10 years in the Caribbean series, winning maybe five, five championships in the last 10 years. They are doing great job, but especially in the office, Leonte. Yes. Ellos están haciendo un tremendo trabajo porque lo están viendo como un negocio y lo están tratando como un negocio donde hay que invertir para poder ganar. La Dominican Way, la Venezuelan Way es ganar sin invertir. Y así nunca ha funcionado en el mundo. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, so the Venezuelan Way and the Dominican Way is winning without investment. In Mexico, they're investing to win, which is obviously um, a, a more reasonable approach. Um, I, I think most of us agree on that. Um, uh, um, and, and obviously the, the, the quality is there as well. Uh, Mexico just qualified for uh, the Olympics and, and they have a big crisis right now. I'm going to leave that to our, uh, um, our next um, panel because uh, they're going to be talking about the, uh, you know, what's happening in Mexico. So uh, um, we're seeing your questions. We're going we're gonna to take a, a few minutes to do questions. So let's go really brief about Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico had a limited season last week, uh, la uh, last year due to pandemic, uh, just to 20 games. Uh, and only four teams out of the regular six teams took the field. Um, Santurce, Carolina, even Santurce as a champion. Uh, Carolina and Aguadilla, uh, they didn't play last year, so they are set to return after the pandemic. Uh, they are thinking that their, sch their schedule this year will start on the second week of November, as usual. And, and they have an ongoing conversation about what's the status of a team called the RA12. Uh, Roberto Alomar opened, uh, started a new team as an initiative. He pretty much opened a franchise uh, playing in San Juan. And uh, that franchise was like, on the field, they didn't do, they, they did pretty bad. They just won two games uh, out of those 20 in uh, last, last season. Uh, it was, you know, it was pretty bad for uh, a bad experience for them. But he's seeing the Roberto Lomar is bringing this team as a development team. So their goal is to bring players that are pretty much out of the system or that but are still young enough so they can have pretty much a second chance. That's the intention. There's no, I don't want to get into the conversation of Roberto Alomar. We all know what's happening and we know that there's ongoing investigations about, um, you know, his sexual, the allegation of sexual misconduct and that, you know, open up a can of worms with MLB and the Toronto Blue Jays. The, the, the Puerto Rico League haven't uh, talked about that uh, yet, but they are supposed that uh, the team, the Alomar team will continue playing. Uh, um, Colombia. Um, I've, I've said publicly that uh, Colombia is pretty much the next frontier of, of Latin baseball. And, and it was like, uh, um, I would say it, it still is. Uh, uh, four or five years ago, the, the growth of the winter, the, the winter league in Colombia was getting a big hype after all these issues that we've been talking of from Venezuela. When, Venezuela. when the Venezuelan team is going down, that is benefiting the Colombian league because players are flocking into the Colombian league looking for jobs. And because they're not part of the, of the winter agreement officially, because they're not an official partner of, they're not an official member of the Caribbean series, Colombia pretty much is an island, a professional island that uh, where MLB players, uh, the, M the, official, the office of the commissioner allows MLB players or signed players to go and play in Colombia. Uh, obviously, more and more players are getting signed of Colombia each year, and the rate of players 
are even now even getting bigger than in Venezuela because there's easier ways to scout. There's good influx of talent. Uh, there's no restrictions on scouting and playing time. And Colombia, like Enrique saying, Colombia is business too. So the problem is, is that two years ago, even before the pandemic, the Colombian Federation right now, the Colombian Baseball Federation, depending on the government, took over the operation of the professional uh, winter league. And there's a lot of uh, conflict of interest. The family of the president of the Baseball Federation, the, the, it's a, a guy called Jimmy Char, he owns two out of the four professional teams, the teams in Barranquilla and Cincelego. Uh, his team pretty much won to the Caribbean Series and represent Colombia as a uh, guest team. Um, so that whole conflict of interest, it's taking over the whole development and no plans have been revealed about what's happening in the upcoming season. And uh, Colombian players right now, the big stars in Colombia that we see uh, right now, uh, um, you know, the, the, the Colombian players like uh, Quintana and uh, Teran and uh, Luis Patino, some of these uh, uh, Colombian MLB players uh, are prioritizing to play outside of Colombia as a foreigners. So they prefer to go and play in the Dominican Republic and Mexico and Venezuela rather than dealing with all these uh, things going on in Colombia. Uh, and uh, last but not least, Cuba. Um, Cuba is a different case. Huh? It's a different case. Yes. Cuba is a different case. Cuba is officially out of the Caribbean series after personal disputes between the Cuban Baseball Federation and the Commissioner of Caribbean Baseball. So they pretty much got into a public discussion, into uh, a, a, a public argument where um, the, Cuba was left out of the tournament. Um, this, even though the, the Cuban changed their whole baseball schedule, the 61st Cuban National Series is going to start in September after some of these authorities, the big baseball authorities in Cuba passed away, unfortunately, due to COVID-19, uh, the National Commissioner of Baseball and the President of the Federation passed away due to COVID. Uh, there's still no news of official heads of baseball in the islands who's going to take over the, the baseball, who's going to be the, the new official heads of baseball in Cuba. Uh, one of the biggest changes is that in the local tournament, for the first time ever, some players that played in the MLB are returning into Cuba, something unthinkable. Um, and one of the cases is Erisbel Arrua Barrena, uh, former Dodger who de decided to go back to Cuba and play into the, into the National Series. And Alexei Ramirez has expressed his interest in, in, doing, in doing so. And uh, their only goal right now is to return to the Caribbean Series, continue their tournament, and enjoy loosening the um, restrictions of U.S. government, especially under um, uh, a Biden administration. Um, so that's, that's pretty much the situation uh, happening with Cuba. Anything to add, Enrique, about Cuba? What do you... What do you foresee Cuba, especially after the big, this big crisis that they didn't, for the first time ever, they didn't qualify to the Olympic Games? Well, Cuba was a big blow. Don't go to the Tokyo. Because, for, because they have a different system in everything, especially in baseball. They have the domestic league, the national, Serie Nacional is like the, the big, Cuba matter beside the international tournament. No World Baseball Classic for coronavirus. They aren't in the Caribbean series. Then Olympic Games is the main thing for Cubans. And they don't go to the, to the Tokyo. Fue un gran golpe para la isla no clasificar a los Juegos Olímpicos. Su... Está claro que ellos han hecho el intento de cambiar algunas cosas, de insertarse en el mundo de, del béisbol, compitiendo en el Clásico Mundial, compitiendo en la Serie del Caribe, en otros eventos que involucran a peloteros profesionales. No sabemos qué va a pasar ahora después del fallecimiento inesperado de Higinio Vélez. Oh, fue muy triste porque 
él era una figura principal, una figura dura de las cosas que se estaban haciendo en Cuba. E incluso vamos a recordar, tú puedes traducir esto, Cuba había hecho un acuerdo con grandes ligas que iba a permitir que los peloteros cubanos jugaran en grandes ligas, pudieran regresar a la isla sin violar una regla del béisbol, aunque el gobierno, en ese caso, cuando se firmó el, 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 el acuerdo, el presidente era Barack Obama, que le dio el ok, pero luego el Donald Trump dijo que eso violaba las bases del embargo este, que yo no sé si tiene sentido, 75, 100 años después, pero existe y básicamente violaba el embargo y eso se echó para atrás. Pero hubo un intento de corregir ese asunto y Cuba dar un gran salto en el béisbol internacional, pero ahora mismo, Leonte, todo está paralizado. Todo está a la espera de ver cuáles van a ser sus próximos pasos, especialmente después de haber fallado en clasificar a los Juegos Olímpicos. Porque yeah, aquí va a haber una revisión completa. Everything is stopped right now and pretty much what, what you know, paraphrasing a little bit what Enrique, what Enrique is trying to say here about Cuba and rounding up the, the idea is that uh, under the Obama administration, uh, Eugenio Vélez, who recently passed away, the National Commissioner of Baseball, Eugenio Vélez and the Obama administration, they were working on an agreement to allow Cuban players to go and play in, in the MLB, and then they were able to return to their countries and e even live in Cuba and still play in the US, going back and forth just as, as uh, players from the Dominican Republic, from Venezuela, Puerto Rico, or any, anything. Uh, under the Trump administration, they set up that those bases were violating the Cuban embargo, and those ideas and those plans were pretty much kept frozen. So after passing away of Vélez and with the new administration, there haven't been any more any more um, news around it. So it's uh, it's just a matter of waiting what's happening. So let's get into some of these questions uh, that you guys have sent. Um, I want to thank you for all of these great, great questions. Uh, um, so we're going to go briefly, try to cover all of these. Uh, Anthony Salazar. Hello, Anthony. So it says, what do you think will be the lasting impact of MLB organizational structures on players from Latin America looking to break into MLB. There'll be fewer opportunities. I would say yes. Uh, uh, I would, uh, I would uh, like in Venezuela, uh, the, the biggest problem with, uh, with uh, the organizational structure is happening in Venezuela. There's, there are gonna be fewer opportunities for Venezuelan players. Um, and I, but I don't think that there's that the, with the new organizational structure, there's going to be least, least opportunities, for example, for Dominican players or Mexican players or Colombian players or even Cuban players. Uh, I think the, the, even though there's less spots in MOB, uh, to fill, they're still going to need a lot of players because still it's cheaper to get talent from Latin America than from the US colleges. And that's a reality. So it's still like with $1 million, you can buy one or two pitchers, luckily, even sometimes not even one good, you know, high profile pitcher from a US college. With $1 million, you can probably buy like, I don't know, 20, like 20, 20, players, 20, 20, 20, 20 players. players. To, you can buy 20 players with $1 million in Latin America, and maybe one of those will be a Pedro Martins. So yes, in Latin America, they're still giving these bonuses of like two, three or four or $5 million. But in Latin America, we're still, we're still getting these bonuses from $10,000, $20,000, $30,000 to sign. So it's a lottery and the teams are going to keep taking advantage of that. Uh, I think I, I think they have a less thing in minor leagues, but uh, they open more space in major league because we, we have a 26 player roster right now. We have a, one more space than the last what 40 years. Correct. We have a more more space now. And if you have the talent, if you have the, the players, Dominican Republic and Venezuela, believe me. 
right now, they have a lot of players ready for play in MLB. The, young, the New York Yankees have when the Dominican kid, they call the Martian, El Marciano, Jason Dominguez. This yeah. kid is the, the next thing. This kid will debut in pro baseball the next week. And right now, he already is the next big thing in MLB. Think about that. It's like a, the oil for Venezuela, like a never end, no? Yes. The players never end in the Dominican Republic. You have a basically, the Dominican population is around 10.5, uh, 11 million people, 3 million. 4 million playing ball right now. Uh, uh, Do you need David... players? Go, go to the Dominican Republic. <laughs> yes, yes. No, seriously. Everybody's playing ball in the Dominican Republic because yeah. it's not only passion, it's not only sports, it's not only game. Right now, if you don't have a big last name, if you are out to the power, if you don't are rich, and you think about the next level in the Dominican Republic, you play ball. Simple as that. As that. Okay. You play ball because you can, you are Fernando Tatis one day playing a hey, 60 year signing with the White Sox in three years, $341 million. Think about that. Yep, yep. Uh, combining uh, David Liebman with uh, Stephen Barnes, it says, how long before MLB has at least one team based in Mexico, as we have now in Canada? And uh, obviously, uh, and David is asking the same for the Dominican Republic, for Santo Domingo. Enrico, what do you, do you think, briefly, uh, we have five minutes, do you think that we are ready to have a team in Latin America? And before you get it, I'll tell you that on my pers from my perspective, Monterrey, Mexico, it's a major league baseball city that is ready to hold, to get, at least to experiment having a team. I think the marketing, the government support, the, uh, it's ready to have, to try to get a major league baseball organization in Monterrey, uh, as as the only as a site in Latin America where a major league baseball organization can play, Enrique. I, I think Mexico can have a, one thing in Mexico City, for example, because it's big population, a lot of money, and they have a people with money for build new stadium, whatever you need. I don't know because sometimes. MLB, the sports, American Sports League want a specific stuff like security uh, y otras cosas que se requieren para tener una franquicia. No solamente es tener dinero y tener mucha gente, es a largo plazo. Si tú puedes aguantar una franquicia. Yo creo que de Latinoamérica solamente México. Y más que Monterrey, yo diría Ciudad México, puede tener un equipo de, de grandes ligas, León. Exactly. Mexico. I agree with you. Mexico, Mexico, it's it's the only place that is fitable right now to have a major league baseball team. And and I agree with you on Canada as well. I think Montreal deserves to have the Expos back. Uh, you know, just talking in I don't know. I don't know. They have it before and they they don't have a stadium, the Espos go. I don't know if they are ready. For sure, big city, rich city, but I don't know if they, right now, they are best place than Mexico City. I don't know right now. Yep, yep, exactly. There's a, that's great debate. Uh, are any, Woody Eckhart, are any winter leagues uh, games in uh, televised in the US? Well, right now, uh, yes, uh, there's a lot of streaming going on, obviously. Um, most of the streaming services of each one of these leagues uh, are, are, available in, are available in the US. So 
through their websites, all the games are now uh, available. Um, more than um, like in the past, uh, in ESPN Deportes, we used to have Mexican, uh, the Mexican Winter League and uh, Dominican League and Venezuelan League, not anymore. Um, we don't have those rights anymore as, as uh, ESPN Deportes uh, in the US, but they have the stream, their own streaming services that are serving the, U, the, um, the USA. Um, it says uh, Gary Belleville, the recent acknowledgement of the Negro Leagues where major leagues have bumped up the career stats of several star players. Do you agree that Mini Minoso should be in the Hall of Fame? Are there any overlooked players that would like to see enshrined? Of course, Mini Minoso is a Hall of Famer. Tony Oliva is a Hall of Famer. Louis Tian is a Hall of Louis Famer. Luis Tian. Felipe Alou. For me, Felipe Alou don't have a stat. Player stats or manager stat for Hall of Fame, but the people, Felipe Alou, 60 years in, in baseball, in MLB, like a player, manager, and executive. For me, no doubt, Felipe Alou is Hall of Famer. Right. Easy for me. Correct, correct. All right, just wrapping it up, I'm gonna leave you guys with the, some big topics. Uh, we talk about a little bit about everything. So uh, the future of winter baseball, it's if it's a develop, development baseball, it's in a competitive local baseball. So that's a constant struggle of these leagues. What are we? Are we a player? Are, are we a place to develop uh, talent for MLB or are we competitive local baseball? Which is towards leaning towards more of competitive local baseball, but MLB, but MLB obviously wants to be more developmental. So it's kind of like half and half and that's where it is. What I call the front office crisis, as everything has been growing, there's still there's there's still of needing or more organized front offices. So it can be, you know, the profession, the level of professionalism is not goes beyond the field and it goes into offices and just to show up what Mexico is doing in terms of the business of baseball. Um, Caribbean series needs a real tournament on unification. There's still a lot of topics surrounding Caribbean series. Um, that has been where, where, you know, in terms of rules, who can participate, which players can go. So that's part of the, the const constant challenges of, of Latin American baseball. The relationship with MLB and the players restrictions. Uh, the MLB keeping the struggles impact in Mexico because the MLB and the Mexican League are not friends right now. So that's preventing the 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 growth and influx of Mexican players into MLB. They're trying to work on that, but still, there's a ways ahead to that. Um, where there's we're, we're still, you know, several steps away from that. And the lack of cooperations of the professional leagues and the uh, uh, World Baseball and Softball Confederation. There's obviously poor representation towards the Olympic goals. Uh, there's um, and obviously the the WBSC is not helping too much in this region to collaborate with the, all of these professional leagues to improve the quality of the international baseball and their Olympic goals. So um, we're going to, I know that you guys are going to, uh, you know, we're going to be talking about um, Olympic goals and Olympic baseball soon. And it's going to have, we're going to have a, um, a really exciting tournament. Yesterday, the Dominican Republic won the, the birth, uh, the last birth. So uh, I think we're going to have a really interesting um a tournament in Tokyo, although it's not going to be with the stars we all want to see. And that's what the goal should be from uh, the whole baseball industry. Like, how can we unify and why, how can we put the best product into the Olympic tournament? So that's part of the goals that pretty much are ways ahead because the next uh, Olympic tour baseball tournament is going to be in Los Angeles in 2028. Uh, Enrique? Uh, anything to add? Uh, lastly, I want to thank you guys for your time, for your attention, for uh, you know the the constant uh, 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 support for uh, international baseball. And you know we're here to ask any questions. You know any any other uh, uh, questions or comments. You guys have my contact through Saber, and I'm you know always willing to be helpful. Enrique. For me, it was a big pleasure. Gracias por tenerme aquí. My English is not very good looking. It's not, it's not good, 
I'm not looking. Gracias por soportarme y que pasen buenas tardes. Oh, your English is great. Channel. Your English is great, Enrique. No. Big virtual head of applause for both you, Leonte, and Enrique. Muchas gracias. This was spectacular. This was a spectacular conversation. Thank you. In our next session, we will get to listen in on a panel about baseball at the 2021 Summer Olympic Games. Our moderator for this conversation is Matthew Casey. Matthew is a senior field correspondent and host at KJZC, Phoenix National Public Radio Affiliate. A regional Edward R. Murrow Award winner, Matt wrote and produced a podcast and radio series in 2020 called Empty Seats about the pandemic's effects on the local sports industry. Matt is a proud Spanish speaker and it's grateful to the immigrants who taught him while working in their restaurants. Matthew, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this panel on Olympic baseball. Uh, Olympic baseball officially starts in a month in Japan and the medal games are scheduled for August 7th. Uh, this year is a six year or a six team tournament featuring Japan, South Korea, Israel, Mexico, the USA, and we just learned this past week, the Dominican Republic. Uh, I'm joined by the general managers for Team Israel, Peter Kurz, and Team USA, Eric Campbell. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, both for taking time today. Uh, Eric, I, I, Eric I, my first question is for you. You've been involved with Team USA for almost three decades. Can you please talk about the significance of baseball returning to the Olympics? Uh, you know, it's it's a it's a great thing. The ba baseball should be in in the Olympics, and it, and it is. Um, and the the path to get there. I mean, it, just just listening to the end of the last panelist, uh, the path was hard. Uh, we we've got we got the GM from Israel. I mean, Israel shocked the world um, in September of 2019 by by qualifying and it just shows how big the game of baseball is around the world how good it is around the world and that you know you you go to a tournament you've got to play and you've got to play the game well and you better be well suited and 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 well selected and well prepared to play the competition you're gonna face so peter uh there's been a lot of uncertainty over whether the Olympics were going to even be played. Israel qualified in 2019 before the pandemic. Talk to me a little bit or explain a little bit about what the time between then and now has been like. Um, first of all, just to, to also answer the previous question, um, the Olymp being in the Olympics is very important. Having baseball back in the Olympics is, is hugely important for small federations like ours. Um, a lot of it is based on governmental support. I was the vice president of European baseball for four years. And I know that many countries there having baseball in the Olympics means that their federations get more funding, even if they have no chance to be in the Olympics. Just having it as an Olympic program means their federation gets more funding as well as ours. Obviously now qualifying for the Olympics was also very good for us. Um, even though <clears throat> because of the turmoil, the political turmoil here in Israel, um, we really haven't received much funding because they're working on budgets that were budgeted before Israel got Israel qualified for the Olympics. Um, but listen, winning in 2019 and qualifying, bringing the guys to Israel a few months later, being here, practicing here, and then all of a sudden having it stop um, was a blow. It was difficult. Um, there were guys who had issues with that. We tried to have Zoom calls um, once a month, every couple of weeks or so, just to have the guys on there to talk about what they're doing, how they're practicing, um, how they're getting ready. Nobody knew in, uh, in the spring of 2020 what was going on. If there would be an Olympics, obviously it was canceled. Um, it was postponed. Hopefully it wasn't canceled. And now, now the guys are getting hot. Now it's getting exciting. Now it's, you know, everybody's talking about it. We're coming together in a couple of weeks. And uh, uh, the guys, we're ready. The guys are ready to play. Um, Eric, Team USA had to bounce back from heartache and the pandemic to qualify for the Olympics. Can you explain for me a bit about the qualifier system that's set up by the World Baseball Softball Confederation? Yeah, you know, the uh, for us in, in the United States, the, the first the chance was the P-12. And, and so uh, I just don't want to assume everybody knows about the P-12, but 
there is a point system at the World Baseball Softball Confederation, and uh, the top 12 earners of points play in an event called the P12. It's a four. It's a it's an event every four years, and it was set up where the top team from Asia that was not Japan, the top finisher there was to qualify for the Olympic Games, and and Korea did that. And and if and if anybody looks even a little bit further, Korea did not qualify for the supplemental or the final world qualify, qualification event. So really, they had to qualify at the P12 um, to qualify for the Olympic Games, and they, and they did. And uh, the United States, with the other teams in the 12 from the Americas, there was only going to be one team from the United States at the P12 that was going to qualify. And uh, only two of us qualified for the final round in Japan. That was USA and Mexico. Uh, we took a two to one lead in the ninth inning against our game against Mexico. And, uh, you know, the, one of our former athletes ended up tying the game with a home run. So certainly uh, we love Matt Clark, but certainly it was painful that Matt Clark hit a home run to tie the game. And then Mexico beat us in the, uh, in the World Baseball Softball Confederation tiebreaker. So they earned you know, a hard fought battle, uh, a great baseball game. Uh, they, they earned that spot. So that kicked us back into uh, the eight teams in the Americas qualifier. And that was scheduled for March of 2020 in the, in the greater Phoenix area. And then it was canceled. And then it was rescheduled for uh, the greater uh, Palm Beach and, uh, and Port St. Lucie areas of Florida. And I tell you, it was, it was every game was tough. Every game was a battle. Um, we ended up winning, but if you, if, but if you look at the way it was set up, um, we played Venezuela on the last, the last game of the event. And if we don't beat Venezuela, Dominican is qualified, uh, based on the tiebreaker system. There was no math. There was, there was no score available in, in the USA Venezuela game for us to qualify if, if we lost the game to Venezuela. Venezuela had, with a win or a loss, they had no path. Because of the way it's set up, they had no path to the Olympic Games, but they were qualified for the final Olympic qualifier. And we just heard on, on the call here, uh, Dominican beat Venezuela in another great baseball game yesterday. Um, they beat Venezuela to qualify for the last spot. But, but every game, in South Florida was a great game, and it sounds like every game in Puebla, Mexico, was a great game as well. Um, and I think it's just another statement about the six teams that, that are in the Olympic tournament, how hard it was for every single one of those teams to get there. Thank you. Uh, uh, Peter, the format for Olympic baseball, there's going to be an opening round of games, and then we get to the knockout, which is double elimination. Uh, what advantages or disadvantages uh, does that offer Team Israel as an underdog in this tournament? Um, first of all, we're, we're by far the underdog. Um, we're number 18 in the world in baseball, um, playing the United States number two, playing Korea number three. That's our division. That's our, our, our division. Um, the other division is Japan is number one, Mexico is number five, and the Dominican Republic, I believe, is number eight or nine in the world. Um, so we're the only one in double figures. So we're way down there. Um, but before we, went to the, we, before we went to the WBC in 2017, ESPN also called us the Jamaican bobsled team. And we ended up defeating, uh, defeating uh, Korea, Taiwan, the Netherlands, and Cuba. So, so I don't mind being the underdog. It's fine for me being the underdog. Um, the system that it's in, the system that this tournament is, is nothing that I've heard of in my 20 plus years of, uh, of international baseball. Um, we're playing the USA in the very first game for both of us on July 29th at uh, 7 p.m. in, 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 uh, in Tokyo, um, which is one o'clock in the afternoon in Israel, which is a great time for baseball. Unfortunately, it's 6 a.m. in the United States on the East Coast and 3 a.m. on the West Coast, but I'm sure many, many people will be up to watch that game of Israel versus the USA. Um, our second game is the next day against Korea. And then we have a day off. Um, but the way the system is after that with the rounds and knockout rounds and everything, it's just, 
I've never heard of it before. Um, I guess it's it's a good thing because you could lose the first two games and still make it to the finals. Um, there's still that possibility. Um, but we're looking at the first the first two games. Let's get over those first two games and then we'll worry about the rest. Uh, Eric, Team USA's final Olympic roster is due out soon, I believe in the next week or so. Can you talk about your roster building strategy given the immense pool of players uh, and the uncertainty? Like, I, I believe we were talking before, I think you had to kind of go through the process twice. So the uncertainty caused by the pandemic. Correct. Um, you know, on one level, just to follow up on Peter, we thought so much of what Team Israel did in 2017 uh, that we hired their manager, Jerry Weinstein, to be our first base coach and bench coach for this Olympic project. So that's how much we thought of their success there and, uh, and Jerry's leadership of what he did for Team Israel. But yeah, in the, in the pool, you have to, it has to be a fit. When we reach out to a player, if he's a free agent, uh, it's got to be a fit in his life. It's got to, it's got to work. He's got to be ready. He's got to prove uh, to us and himself that he will get he will get ready um, to play in these games because there's someone that's not ready. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's not going to work. Uh, but if you are going to borrow, you know, and I think everybody here, everybody works for a federation here. We all know what borrowing players from, from professional leagues uh, looks like and feels like, and the reality uh, you, you know, you, the, the immensity of that pool, you know, you, you ask and you ask and it, and it may be that it's a great idea, uh, and the club wants to support it and the player wants to do it, but it's not the fit at this moment for that player to join a roster. So you go through that process. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, you look at who you're going to play, what you're going to have to do to be successful in the, in the tournament. And uh, you know, everybody's got a different style. Um, but you, but you also look and, and you try to build a team that's going to be successful in this, in this specific tournament. Peter, the, the same question for you. I mean, the baseball team is going to be more than a quarter of the entire Israeli delegation. Is that right? How did, how did you build your roster? Well, you're probably talking here about two totally extreme examples of how to build rosters. Um, on the one hand, you have the United States, which has an unlimited population pool. Um, Israel is the smallest populated country of the six teams. We have 9 million people. Um, so, and, and I, I just heard that the Dominican Republic has about 10 million people and 3 million of them play baseball. Um, <laughs> so in Israel, there's 9 million people and about a thousand play baseball. Okay, so that's basically our population group from there. Um, although we also, because of our law of return, where anybody who is Jewish um, can get Israeli citizenship, um, we're able to also get American Jews um, to what's called, made, called coming on Aliyah, which means to get Israeli citizenship. Um, and that we've done very successfully the last uh, three or four years. Um, and, but even, even if you include American Jews, I mean, how many American Jews are there? There's, there's six or seven million American Jews. So we're talking about 16 million people altogether to draw from. So it's also not, I mean, versus the United States, uh, Japan, Mexico, uh, Korea, where we're really, we're, really we're, we're larger, maybe a larger population size than the Dominican Republic, but the Dominican Republic is, is baseball. Here you ask in the, in the street about baseball, and the average reply is it's an American sport, and, and uh, it's not played in Israel, and it's boring. Um, so that's, that's the basic uh, assumption over here. But Israel had a delegation to, um, to the last Olympics four years ago of 47 athletes, and this delegation will be 90 athletes. When I came in September of 2019, after the qualifying round, I came to the uh, Olympic uh, NOC here, the Israeli NOC in Israel, um, and I met with them and I told them, you know, they knew we qualified, they congratulated me. They were very happy about it. At the time they had 40 athletes going to Tokyo and I brought them an extra 24. So they were a little bit overwhelmed by that. Um, and they really, and, and it's the first time that Israel has a team sport in the Olympics, a team ball sport in the Olympics, since 1976, since Montreal when they had a soccer team. So for, for here in Israel, we've gotten a lot of press over the last few months. We'll be getting a lot more press going, going forward. Um, we're really seeing this as an opportunity, as a great opportunity to grow baseball in Israel. Um, being in the Olympics, getting a medal, hopefully. Um, at the same time, we're also building two new fields in Israel. Basically, we have one baseball field in Israel. Um, it's, a, it's a high school type of field for the United States. 
but we're building two new fields right now. So together with those two new fields, the old adage, uh, if, you, if you build it, they will come, um, is very true. When a kid sees a beautiful green field, he loves it. Um, so I'm hoping just like judo 30 years ago, uh, when Israel got its very first Olympic medal, Israel has nine Olympic medals, that's it. So when they got their very first Olympic medal in judo, it, expand, it exploded. Today we have uh, the potential to get maybe two or three uh, Olympic medals in judo. Um, but it really exploded here in Israel. And I hope the same thing happens with baseball. Um, and that's, that's, that's the main reason we're in the Olympics, to get to develop the program here locally and to put up some role models for the kids, uh, kids, the kids over here. Yeah, I, I wanted to talk to you about the, the, I wanted to ask a little bit more about that history because um, you had mentioned we had had a chance to talk. You've mentioned that perform Israel's performance in judo in a past uh, Olympics had spurred growth in it, drawn interest, and that you were hoping for a do-over uh, or, or a repeat with baseball. Can you talk a little bit about how that would translate, how the excitement of making the medal round would translate into growing baseball in Israel, where I believe baseball has been played for about 50 years? Yeah, baseball's been here about 50 years. It was new immigrants who came from the United States. They brought the game here. Um, today, as I mentioned, there's about a thousand kids and adults playing baseball in Israel. We have an adult league, not a professional league, but it's an adult league with about five teams. Um, and it's grown a lot over the last five years or so. Um, it's more than doubled uh, in, in, in growth. Um, we thought that WBC would give us a huge push in 2016 and 2017. Um, it, it did less so. Um, it, was, it wasn't really that much televised in Israel. People didn't really know about it that much. And the Olympics will be a lot more. The Olympics are definitely a lot more out there. Uh, three days ago, we went to the president of Israel, the whole Olympic delegation, um, including two of our ball players, because most of our ball players are in, in the United States playing minor league or, or, or independent ball. So we brought two, two ball players to Israel to go there, to be with the delegation. Um, a lot of press there, a lot of activity going on, a lot of interviews. They were really talked about a lot. Um, and we're hoping very much that this is what can really push uh, baseball forward. Here in Israel, uh, soccer and basketball are king. Those are the two largest sports by far. Um, and they also get most of the funding. So now we're getting a lot more funding because we're in the Olympics. A medal will help us a lot. So if the U.S. wants to just lay down and give us, you know, let us beat them, then that would be nice. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do it because we're, we're good. Um, but really, um, we're, we're really looking to expand the program here. And I really think that by, we have, we have four kids who grew up here in the program attending colleges now in the States um, and hoping for careers. We have some other guys. The, the 18 to 21 age group is, is problematic here in Israel because that's the age group that they have to go to the army, to the military, and it's mandatory. Um, but the military does allow certain dispensation for gifted athletes, for gifted musicians, um, for other for gifted artists. So we do have today, we have five baseball players who are in the army um, as baseball players. They go to the army in the morning. In the afternoon, they're, they're released to, to, do, to do their baseball stuff. And they can also go overseas uh, for three months a year. So they have special privileges and advantages, but they're still in the army for three years. So when a kid leaves Israel, if he's good in baseball, he'll be attending a college at 21, 22 years old, which as we know is already a little bit old for baseball. Um, but we're hoping with, again, more activity, more, more advantages, we have a major leaguer, uh, uh, Dean Kramer from uh, Baltimore. Um, he's an Israeli, he holds Israeli citizenship. Um, and we're looking for to get more, more players into the major leagues for sure. Uh, Eric, we recently learned that there's going to be allowed up to 10,000 local fans uh, at the Olympics, at the baseball games. What effect do you expect this to have on what's already in a, a unique and rare setting? I think it'll be embraced by the players. You know, I, I know from a staff perspective, yes, but I think that the play, I can only speak for the U S team players, but they'll embrace that. And I think that, you know, the O word, the Olympic word, the Olympic games, um, it has a draw around the world and certainly with baseball players around the world. And the fact that, you know, thinking they were going to play in empty stadiums, you know, they, they've had a little bit of that with, with COVID, but, I think it's going to be a breath of fresh air to have fans in the stadium. And I think, I think it could have a chance to raise the level of play quite honestly. How about, how about you, Peter? What, what do you, how do you expect? I mean, I assume that news was welcomed by your, by your players, by your team. How do you expect having fans to play out? In 2017, we played in the Tokyo dome um, and there's nothing like the Tokyo dome. It's like Yankee stadium. Um, and we played against Japan. The final game was against Japan, and there were 50,000 fans in the seats there. 
um, and our outfielders couldn't hear each other. You know, when they were trying to communicate with each other, they couldn't hear each other. There was, there was such such a noise level. The Japanese fans are great. Um, they really, they, they come out there, they cheer, they're very well organized, um, a lot more organized than American fans in a lot of ways. Um, I think it'll be great. I think it'll be wonderful to have fans in the stands. If it's only 10,000 people, it's a, I understand it's a 30,000 seat stadium. So it will look partly full. Um, and I'm looking forward to it. Definitely looking forward to having the Japanese there. They know their baseball um, and we're happy to be in Japan. Eric, uh, baseball is not expected to be played again at the Olympics until 2028 in Los Angeles. How much does the U.S. not having to qualify, should we choose to have pick baseball for the Olympics? How much would not having to qualify as the host country help the chance that major leaguers, top major leaguers, uh, would play in 2028? Well, it, it, it could potentially it could potentially help. I think that we're sitting here in, in uh, June 27, 2021, and we're talking about games in 2028. So hopefully the conversation will – will ramp up at the right levels about how this would look. And hopefully there's a lot of studies and, and, you know, the, the, the pros of doing this is, is being discussed even now. And so I think with that much time, um, I think this much time is more important than maybe not having the qualifiers, but, uh, but certainly, you know, when you, when you host the Olympic games and you're qualified, uh, and you're setting, you know, you, you have forces within your country setting up the tournament. Um, you know, certainly let's, let's all hope that, that that conversation will be strong and, and potentially move forward. Uh, Peter, I want to mention also maybe, as I mentioned before, um, not having baseball in the Olympics in 2024 um, is a blow to, to a lot of countries, as I mentioned before, because the small countries now after this Olympics it's going to be a non-Olympic sport, baseball, for the next four years or three years. Um, so again, a lot of the funding will go down. Um, a lot of funding will be reduced. And, and I know that in our federation, for example, I mean, they're talking about things, you know, if you have, if you have a medal in 2021 20, and a medal in 24, you get certain benefits that other, others don't get. And we won't have a chance to get a medal in 24. Um, so that, that's definitely a blow. It's not easy. And I hope wherever it's going to be in 32, um, that baseball will continue there because Again, it's important for the baseball uh, organization around the world, for all the federations around the world to have baseball in the Olympics, even if they have no chance to get there, um, but still just being part of the baseball world in the Olympics is important. It's a, it's a very important thing financially for the, for the baseball world. What would have to happen for, uh, for the Olympic committee? What would be the process for the Olympic committee to once again make baseball a permanent summer Olympic sport? I'll take one stab at it, Peter, but, you know, I, I, you know, the, the best thing we can do as federations is put our best foot forward and, and, and show the world a great baseball tournament. That's the most important thing we can do is to gather interest around the world and put a lot of eyes uh, on baseball. And, and, and then as, as Peter's mentioned, and, and, and then that development doesn't stop, you know, it just doesn't stop on, on August 10th, 2000. 21 that that baseball programs are developed around the world dollars are put into these programs uh you know the people associated with baseball at high levels get out into the world and, and are ambassadors to the game of baseball so these are the best things that we can control uh, and then and then hopefully it becomes kind of like a slam dunk that hey this thing's this thing's got momentum and, and the world needs to see a great tournament every four years. It would also help for MLB to, uh, to take off a week and, and uh, release players to be able to play in the Olympics. That would be nice. Uh, Peter, when we spoke the other day, you were talking about the, the buildup between, I mean, the, the, the game start, I, I believe the first game is a month from tomorrow. You're talking about the buildup of bringing your team together and uh, people were already playing. Walk me through the next month. What is this? What are the status of your players right now? And, and when will they all come together? And, and, and when will you head for, for Tokyo? Well, we've got, we've got our minor leaguers. Um, well, I'm still waiting to get here approval from, from MLB if they can play for us or not. Um, so they're doing their minor league seasons. They're, they're involved. It's much better than it was a year ago when we had no idea what was going on. 
Um, so they're involved with there. Um, and many of them will be meeting us in Tokyo. Um, we have our independent league guys who are, who are playing independent baseball, um, who are also in their seasons. And they might, we're having a, a training camp for two weeks um, in the Northeast, which was very graciously uh, approved by the, uh, by the USA Federation that we could be there. We, we couldn't do the same thing in Israel, so we needed to use it in the United States. Um, so some of those guys will be joining us also in the training camp. We have some guys, I guess, like Todd Frazier, um, who decided to join these independent league teams and the great drawing cards. Um, Danny Valencia and Ian Kinsler will both be playing in Long Island in the, in the Ducks for a couple of weeks. Um, so they're, you know, they're ex-major leaguers and they'll be having drawing cards, but they'll be joining, joining our training camp as well. Um, and then we have the guys who are retired and not playing professionally or whatever, um, and they'll also be coming to the camp. So we'll be starting a camp on July 7th, um, going to the 21st doing an old time barnstorming tour, um, visiting stadiums. We'll be playing in Brooklyn. We'll be playing in Connecticut. We'll be playing in, uh, in New York. We'll be going down to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, uh, to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, to, uh, to Bethesda, Maryland. Not, you know, small cities, small stadiums, um, just having fun, going out there, getting at bats, getting the guys ready, um, being out there for the, for the Jewish community, at least to come out and to, to, to cheer us on, to, to cheer the team on. As I mentioned, we also need to do some fundraising. So one of our campaigns is called the 25 campaign where um, we're trying to, we're saying that we're sending 24 Israeli players to, is, to, to Tokyo to play for Team Israel. And we see the whole Jewish community or support community as the 25th player. And we'd like them to join us as the 25th player, both emotionally, morally, financially, whatever they can do to help us uh, be the 25th player and stand behind that team. We've got uh, merchandising out there trying to raise money to, to support the team and to support the effort. Um, and from there, we, we fly to Tokyo. We're gonna get there for the opening ceremonies. So the guys are gonna march in the opening ceremonies. You have one chance in a lifetime to do that. Um, you know, they talk about some Olympic medalists uh, being there for three, four, five Olympics. I think this will be the only chance for almost all our guys, maybe, maybe seven years from now, some of them will be back. Um, and then having about five days of practices in Tokyo, um, I was just told uh, today, actually, that we won't be able to have any exhibition games there, which we were planning on doing. Um, but they've put in some kind of mechanism there where the other teams cannot have any exhibition games for whatever reason. Um, and on 29th of uh, July, we play Team USA. We'll be ready. Eric, uh, same question. I know like, the, the roster's coming out soon. Yeah. Uh, walk me through the next month. Well, you know, like I said, baseball is a daily game, so uh, we're, we're trying to get roster locked down on July 1st, and, and then we're going we're gonna to ask for players to report to our training complex in Cary, North Carolina on July 16th, and, and we'll train at, at our complex and uh, play one game at the Durham Bulls Athletic Park and, and we'll, we will also travel on July 21st and, and get the guys there and, and be excited about everything happening with Olympics, opening ceremonies, getting acclimated in Asia and, uh, and getting ready for the 29th of, of July. So again, though, every, everybody, you know, base, baseball is a daily game. And, uh, you know, you would uh, I've had a lot of great mentors, but, you know, it's, uh, you know, you don't. You get better, you get worse. So you play every day, you get a chance to get better. You never stay the same. And uh, that's that's our hope. And uh, you, know, you keep your fingers crossed on injuries. Uh, if a player is called up, then that's a great thing for him and you're happy for him. And and you hopefully you're ready for, for who's next to join the roster. Uh, going back a, a, a question with you, I, I spoke as if, like, as if it was assumed that the USA will pick baseball for the 2028 Olympics in, in LA. What's your read on that? I mean, to me, it seems pretty clear, but what do you think? I, I think it's a slam dunk. <laughs> I, mean, I, would, I would think the, the venues are built. Uh, the cult, the baseball culture is, is there. Um, it's a, you know, it's, it's not just, you know, in, in, in the, in LA County, you know, everybody, everybody plays baseball. We had our guests from the Dominican Republic and, you could go anywhere in LA County or Orange County or any County in California and baseball's played at all levels. And so 
I think it's a slam dunk, but I haven't, you know, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just one person here. Well, with, with what Peter said about MLB releasing its players, if, if you could make that pitch to commissioner Manfred for 2028, what would it be? I just, I mean, obviously the, the visibility of the game, you know, the, the visibility of the game and, and, uh, and what it can do, the legacy that it can provide. Uh, Peter, Peter said it great, you know, that then in 2032, if let's, you know, there's rumors that it's Australia, maybe it's a slam dunk there too. Yeah. This thing just gains momentum that it's every four years. Uh, so the, the legacy and the continued growth of the game in terms of players, fans, uh, whatever it may be, we need to grow the game of baseball. And if, you know, and if it, and if it can't happen, then continuing to cultivate that recently retired player with, with the player that's just, it's a major league baseball player right now, uh, but doesn't have a chance to be called up yet. So, you know, at the, at the end of the day, that's another, you know, thing you have to keep going after as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter, going back to what you were saying about there not being a, tw not being baseball in 2024, being, uh, uh, making it more difficult for the smaller federations. Assuming that your wish comes true and, and, and Israel medals this year, what would be the strategy for keeping baseball popular uh, between now and 2028 in Israel so that, that people are as engaged as they are now, then? Again, um, first of all, one of the advantages maybe of having uh, the Olympics now, having had a five-year cycle, is that, is that non-Olympic baseball, baseball not in the Olympics, will only be a three-year cycle. OK, because as soon as August 10th, whatever federations there are, will not get any funding. I mean, maybe it'll take till the end of the year, but certainly in 2022, our federation <clears throat> will get much, much less funding from the government. And I'm sure the same thing is true with other federations. But by the end of 2024, um, that funding will come back because then baseball is coming back into the Olympics for the next for the next uh, cycle. OK, so that's the way that's the way things work. So I guess having only three years until the next Olympics and having it be a non-baseball Olympics is only three years and not four years, so that's good. Um, but as I mentioned, I really hope that we're able to, to double and triple the number of players playing baseball in Israel. Um, that's our goal. Um, we'll ha again, we'll have two, two new fields. Basically, I mean, basically we have one and a half fields because there's the one field that I spoke about in, in Petah Tikva in the Baptist village. Um, and there's another field in Kibbutz Gezer, which used to be a softball field, but that became a baseball field, so they expanded it. So there's still a light bulb, a light pole in the middle of a center field, because they expanded that for baseball. <laughs> and they never moved the light pole. So there's padding around the pole and everything. And players, you know, there's a little hill going up to it, so players know that they're that they're getting close to the to the to the hill, the the, the center fielder. Um, but still, it's a, that's a half a field. Um, so again, having two more fields, meaning tripling our capacity, our, our theoretical ability to have uh, to have games there is very good. We're hoping that we can host also European championships coming to Israel because for the European championship, we need more than one field um, and, and, and have, have teams come there. Maybe one day the WBC qualifiers. Um, so that would be, that would be nice. Um, and if we do that, baseball will naturally expand. And once it naturally expands, you're also getting more funding. You're obviously, you know, getting bigger and getting more funding. So that's nice. Um, and I think again, going back to, 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 the, to the Olympics, um, having that Olympic funding is good. I also think MLB can, can do a better job of helping international baseball. Um, we have the WBC, which is great, which is nice, uh, but there is more, more that MLB can do to help smaller countries um, get more funding, you know, get more equipment. Um, we could use a lot of equipment in Israel, uh, baseball equipment, it's not sold in the stores here. It's not readily available. Um, we have our president uh, lives in Israel, but works as a dentist in New Jersey. So every two weeks he goes back and forth and brings two suitcases full of, uh, full of baseball equipment, but don't tell the Israeli customs authorities that uh, because they'll stop them next time. Um, so so that's, those are the challenges. Those are the challenges that small federations face. I mean, Eric, you know, doesn't realize that, doesn't know about those kind of things, but this is uh, the, what we and, and a lot of other federations also in Europe, because as I mentioned, I was in the European, and, and baseball's growing. And after all that, I mean, baseball's growing. The, 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 the excitement of baseball in Japan, Korea is incredible. In Latin America, it's there. And even in Europe, it's getting much, much bigger, much more popular. Italy um, is huge. Uh, Germany, 
uh, uh, Holland, Netherlands, uh, France. It's it's, it's really a, a huge uh, a huge thing. We're getting bigger. Eric, can you talk about talk? A, this is a little bit outside of the Olympics realm, but how the way the way the game is studied now? How we study the game now? Can you kind of spin that forward to? Maybe the way it will be studied in 2028 or in 20 years from now. Yeah, I, I think I think one of you know Matt and I you you and I've talked about. It. I think one thing is if you go to the origins of the game and you hit a you hit a two hopper to the shortstop and and you get out of the box and you run hard and and the the shortstop if he plays it right he's probably going to throw you out by a step or a half a step and 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 we're playing baseball in 2021 and that holds true when George Brett talked about his retirement he said if I you know he goes I don't know if I want a base hit or if I want to hit a two hopper to the second baseman and and, and get thrown out by a half a step because that'll kind of uh illustrate my the way I played in in my career so you can look at those basic things and say what was the game yesterday what was the game today and what is going to be the game tomorrow but I think we all know that the game today is greatly shaped by what what the, the folks uh, at Sabre have done over the history of the game. So if you turn on, I, I you know, we, we all have a million examples, but I turned on the Royals Rangers game yesterday and Kyle Zimmer threw the first inning and, and uh, Chris Bubich was going to, you know, was, was going to go after that. And, uh, uh, and, you know, it didn't, it didn't work to a, to a T, but, uh, but then you, on the other side, you had a guy like Kyle Gibson that's been kind of a budding star, and 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 he showed why he's a a budding star that's going to, you know, going to do it more in a traditional manner. So, I, I think that the that that everything that's studied works, and there's but there's trends today, and the game of baseball is going to adjust to those trends. So in 2028, there's going to be new trends that that are going to they're, they're going to have to be incorporated. They may be old things, but they may be dusted off and they may be new in 2028, but that's the way the game's going to be played in 2028. But, but quite honestly, whatever's happening in 2028 is going to be shaped on how the game is studied in 2021 tonight. You know, so if I turn on a game tonight, if Peter turns on a game tonight, Matt, if you turn on a game tonight, uh, the, the, the things that are happening tonight have been shaped by the way the game is studied and, and, and the adjustments to what has to be done to play successful baseball. And that'll never change. Would you, would you like to add anything to that, Peter? Um, no, I mean, Eric got it all. <laughs> we'll take some, uh, some, some questions from the audience. Now, if anybody has questions and would, uh, would like to submit them. I think you can just write them into your chat and we'll pick them up there. Um, first question comes, uh, I think you've kind of retouched on this a bit, Peter, but from David Hughes, he wants to know if you all are satisfied with the level of cooperation you've received from MLB or any other league, any of the other leagues in which your potential players play. Um, I guess that means you're referring to uh, having players, releasing players for the Olympics or not. Um, yes, I think in general, I mean, listen, a player is a very valuable commodity to a, to a team. And we understand that. Uh, you know, we have some young guys in the minor leagues and we have some, some guys uh, potentially in the major leagues. Um, and they're, they're definitely valuable commodities because they've been nurturing them and, and, and uh, you know, trying to, working with them and, work, and, and trying to develop those players. And, and by us asking to take them for a week or for two weeks or whatever, um, with the potential for injury, uh, the potential for abuse um, is there. Um, uh, Ad, uh, Andrew, Andrew is, Andrew, uh, Andrew uh, is, our, is, our, is our pitching coach. Um, and he's uh, definitely um, uh, talking to MLB teams and minor league teams about how to treat pitchers and how to, how to take care of pitchers in the, in the, during the during the tournament, um, there's no doubt about it. Um, also, our, our, our manager is talking to teams about that. Um, so for the most part, they've been okay to Major League Baseball, Major League Baseball, um, and I have no complaints about that. Again, what I mentioned before about, about supporting us 
a more international baseball. I think they're, I mean, the WBC is great. It's wonderful. But I think they have to go with something beyond that and support more countries and, and, and federations in what they're doing. Eric? I, if I, I could speak from the, from the 30 clubs. I think they all want Olympic baseball to be successful and they understand what it does for the, for the growth of the game when, when the Olympic tournament is successful and they want to support their players having an Olympic baseball opportunity, but it has to be a fit. So I, these, these conversations have been ongoing since January, February daily with, with the 30 clubs. And then you can expand out towards, you know, if a player, if a player is, uh, you know, in Mexico or if he's in Korea or if he's in Taiwan or if he's in Japan, um, that's more agent based, uh, based on the current status of that player's contract. But, but in Korea and in Japan, they're going to suspend their league play uh, during, during this Olympic tournament. So obviously it's important to those two leagues too, that um, the focus is put on this Olympic tournament. Another question from Ryan Schroer. I hope I'm pronouncing that, his last name right. Uh, what impact, this is for you, Eric, what impact would a good showing by Team USA have on baseball here in the U.S.? W would it spark similar interest as the Women's World Cup did 20 years ago? Well, well certainly, I think that um, we, want, we want young players to, to play the game of baseball. And when they, when they you know, there's, there's a lot of great opportunities for them to do that, but we want them to stay. In, in the game of baseball. Um, I can only speak to it from, from a volleyball perspective, but my daughter had never, I've never seen a volleyball in my daughter's hands. And after the 2012 uh, volleyball tournament in London, uh, my daughter said, sign this. And, and she's, I said, what is it? She said, just sign it. I said, well, what is it? She said, it's a waiver for me to go out for the volleyball team at my middle school. And I said, well, that's great. I'll sign it right now. But I've never seen a volleyball in your hand. She said, just sign it. So hopefully you inspire young people around the world to play the game of, of baseball. And, uh, and that's what Olympic sport does. And, and baseball is no different than the other Olympic sports. We, uh, a great Olympic tournament will inspire young people to, to play the game of baseball and to continue to play the game of baseball and, and to aspire to play for our national teams uh, and national teams around the world. I, I know this might be uh, a little difficult, uh, but when without revealing any big secrets, but since you, since the USA and team Israel are playing each other in the first game in Tokyo next month, um, Eric, what's the scouting? What, what, what would be the scouting report on Tim Israel? What, what are you prepared? What, what, what do you want to prepare for? I already talked about Matt Clark beating us in, in uh, 2019 uh, P12, and the, the the road to the World Baseball Class Championship for us in 2019 was paved by Ian Kinsler. So obviously, uh, obviously we got a target on his back. You know, they, we don't want him to beat us, and we know how good Danny Valencia is, and we just know that sport. And team dynamics, when when players when players start to feel it, they do well, and that's evidenced by how Israel did in 2017 at the World Baseball Classic, and how they did at the qualifier, uh, at, you know, against the Netherlands, against Italy, against Germany. So we we better be ready to play great baseball. Is all I got to say. Uh, Peter, Team USA's roster isn't out yet, but. What do you know inherently that you need to be ready for when it comes to playing Team USA in a month? First of all, they have to be ready for Sandy Koufax because he's getting Israeli citizenship as well. <laughs> so he'll be our starting pitcher against Team USA. <laughs> um, listen, we have we uh, uh, I don't I don't deal with that. I mean, we have a, a capable staff. We have a, a coaching we have a coaching staff, and we also have a scouting staff. Um, and they're keeping good track of, uh, of what's going on. I know that Eric, our, Eric, uh, Eric Holtz is our manager. He lives actually in White Plains, New York, which is not far from Tom's River, um, where, where one of his players is, is, is playing minor league baseball, independent league baseball there. So he's keeping an eye on him. Um, and we're, you know, we're looking forward to, to seeing the team. I mean, 
today with with all the video that's going on and all the video possibilities, you know, we can see all these guys in action. There are very few unknowns. Um, so we're getting a lot of video coverage and everything and all the guys will be well prepared. Um, you know, Israel technologically is very advanced. So we're also looking to have all kinds of, uh, there might be some drones going overhead, maybe you know, over the stadium, I don't know. We're looking, you know, maybe underground, we'll have some, uh, some hearing devices, uh, but we're looking, definitely looking to have that extra advantage technologically. And also, as Eric said, um, Team Israel is, is, is coming together. They're bonding, they've been bonding for the last four or five years. You know, we're bringing additional players like Kinsler into it. Um, we had a training camp a month ago in Arizona. Kinsler fit right in with the other guys. Uh, it was just, it was great to see. Um, and, uh, you know, team, team USA is the same way. I mean, you see these guys and you hear them talking about playing for Team USA, how different it is than it is playing for a team in the minor leagues or the major leagues. It's just a much different kind of thing. It takes out it's something inside of you when you play for your country. Um, and it's true for, for the guys in, in, in the Dominican Republic, for the guys in Mexico and in, in Japan and in Korea, certainly in the United States, certainly for Israel. Um, but there's a little bit more for Israel because it's not just a country, it's also the heritage. Um, and that makes, that makes a little bit extra difference, gives us a little extra edge. Maybe we've got God on our side as well. That helps a little bit um, coming from Israel. Uh, and the guys have been to the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall there and prayed there. So hopefully that'll give us that extra advantage as well. Uh, our next question comes from Leslie Heafy. Uh, she asks, or he asks, is there any conversation to bring women's baseball to the Olympics, Olympics since it's it's happening around the world? Do I? Well, I, I, could, I could start. I mean, I don't know that it's that it's ramped up. I'm sure that um, you know Japan's women's national team program. I mean, they have an industrial league in Japan, so. You start to see more and more leagues like that. If, if the USA and Canada and Puerto Rico and, and Cuba, you know, the countries around the world, if you start to see more of these uh, opportunities for women to keep playing baseball, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of independent leagues for baseball. Uh, but Japan's model, you know, would be a great model around the world. And I think that, uh, you know, that, that could be, a starting path but you know we joined forces with the world baseball the world baseball softball confederation has joined forces to get bat and ball sports back into the olympics so right now the women's discipline is fast pitch softball and the and the the men's is is baseball and uh, i'm sure that the people in new zealand would say there should be men's softball and uh, the 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 women's players in Japan and USA should would say there should be women's baseball in the Olympics. And, and, and those are great aspirations and there's no reason why someone should lose that aspiration. We have another question here from uh, Cohen Christopher um, with, with the talks of the MLB potentially getting more involved with helping federations for the Olympics, do you see the potential for an Olympic break in the MLB schedule similar to what we had seen in the NHL schedules? Um, I, I would hope so for, for, 20, for 2028. I would hope that MLB would come um, and perhaps instead of their all-star break um, that year, the Olympic year, they would give a longer break for the Olympics. I don't think you need to give more than a, than more than a week. I think a week is fine. Um, that could, you know that could be enough time if you just you know cut, cut put down the number of games and everything. Try to condense them more into that one week. Certainly in Los Angeles, you've got you know plenty of stadiums where you could have those games. Um, I would love to have that. I would really look forward to that. Have the MLB players play for their countries. That would be incredible. I think, from my perspective, Matt, you know the uh, you know there's there's been modeling. I, I've seen it. I've seen an eight team Olympic tournament model where it can be played in five days. You know, you have two pools of four, you play three games in your pool, three games, three days. Um, you got to be in the top two and you're out of your pool, which would be great baseball if eight teams around the world run the Olympics. And then you play a semis and you play a final. And uh, that could be a five day tournament. Is getting a, a professional team's permission for a player to play for the national team, is that the most difficult step in, in building a roster for, for a national team? 
Yeah, I mean, certainly you uh, certainly you want to build a team with the best available players that are then in a team that's built to to play the competition. So if you just say, you know what, Japan's at home and they're going to suspend their uh, they're going to suspend their league and they're going to brand themselves as Team Samurai, which is their their ultimate. You know, they do that for the World Baseball Classic and they're going to do it for this Olympic tournament. And that's that's the top level team that they can put together. And uh, you better be you, know, you better be ready to beat the other four as well as Japan. But uh, to do that, you you better you know, you, you better have the best players. So, yes, you know, I mean, uh, you know, selling selling your your product as a national team to go to an Olympic Games is is one of the biggest things you do. And then, and then the, you know, but you can never dismiss the team building and the chemistry and the magic that happens to, to good teams as well. Peter. Uh, again, we, we didn't have much of that much of an issue because we don't have that many uh, high level players um, and whoever we have are retired. So it wasn't that big an issue. Um, so for us, again, MLB has been good with that. The, 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 the minor league teams, if they haven't released them, if they're not releasing them to our training camp, at least they're releasing them to go to Tokyo. So that's also something that, and they can train with us for five days then before the tournament. Um, but, you know, working with MLB on that <clears throat> has been fine. <clears throat> um, and we're looking forward just to having those players with us and join us and, uh, and be there. Uh, question from, a question from Jeff Orner. He's asking to confirm, so women fa women's fast pitch softball is in the Olympics this year, right, yes. gentlemen? Yes. 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 Okay, thank you. Uh, now, it'll, it'll just, I'll just try to add a little more color to that. It'll be played in the Yokohama Stadium in front of baseball. So uh, the first game on the 28th is going to be in Fukushima, and it'll be Japan versus, sounds like, uh, Peter, help me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like it'll probably be Japan and uh, Dominican. Yes. And, uh, and, and in essence, what's happening at the Yokohama Stadium is it's going to be converted by some really great baseball facilities people from softball to baseball so that we can we can have baseball in there on the 29th i understand there'll be a mound coming up from the ground <laughs> so we're getting near the end if anybody else has uh, a question for eric or peter please put it in the chat um i guess uh, my last question for you gentlemen would be you know japan has a great baseball tradition um you know talk about what it's going to feel like to, to to play olympic baseball in, in a country with, with such a tradition. I just remember 2017 when we came to Japan from Korea, which had a great, has a great baseball tradition, but to go from Korea to Japan is like going, is, is, is like 20 times greater um, of the same effect. I mean, they all know baseball. They know the players, they know the game. Um, they know who's doing well. Um, they cheer, they, they're there for you. They support you. Even if you're, the, even if you're an opponent, they still support you there because they want to see good baseball. And they're great fans to come out there. Um, the crowds were, were very well disciplined, um, very loud, very loud. A lot of a lot of cheerleading, which we don't see in the states. Um, they have real cheerleaders on top of the dugouts and everything, uh, chanting, going together and, and doing cheers and doing chants, um, reg regular chants that they do for each player. Um, so that's all done there, and it's great. And I, I'm looking forward to it. Definitely looking forward to going to going to Japan. Even though this Olympic will be this Olympics will be much different than any other Olympics. Um, and we'll be more or less in a bubble in, in Tokyo Bay in the Olympic Village and won't be able to go around Tokyo at all, unfortunately. Um, but it'll still be, it's still be in the Olympics. I mean, it'll be fun. Matt, if, you, if just a little more background, that the high school baseball tournament in Japan, um, it, it's played in a lot of these stadiums, a lot of their professional stadiums, and they have... They'll play them in capacity, but the Q rating for TV audiences in Japan for the high school tournament is bigger in their country than the Super Bowl is in the United States. So I just think it says how important baseball is to the overall culture uh, of Japan. Uh, we'll take our last question from Rich, who wants to know if the Olympic Games are going to be played with the ghost runner on second in extra innings and how you gentlemen feel about bringing in those new MLB innovations into international baseball. Yeah. I mean, for it's, 
in the 10th inning, we go to the World Baseball Softball Confederation tiebreaker, which is first and second, no outs. And it's in, in 08 in Beijing, when that was introduced, you could actually reset your lineup and you could no longer do that. You know, it's, it's where you are. So that hitter, wherever you are with that hitter, the previous two hitters go to first and second. Um, and my feelings are, I hated it when it came out in, in 08 in Beijing. But when you're borrowing someone's pitchers from uh, another organization, uh, I love it now. It's because it does end games. Uh, I think some of the studies say that it ends games close or a little bit more than an 80% clip in that first inning. And I think that's a good thing for pitching, for fans, uh, to, get a, to get a result of the baseball game and to not um, stress out pitching. Peter, yeah, anything no, to I add? Think I think it's great because we've worked, we've been playing that way for the last five or six years in European play. Um, they also have a clock. There's also a pitch clock, which I think will be used in the, in the Olympic tournament as well. Again, these things get the, get the games moving quicker, and that's what's important, to get baseball moving that much quicker. Great. Uh, well, that's going to be the, the last question for our panel discussion um, on Olympic baseball. I want to thank Peter Kurz, general manager of Team Israel, and Eric Campbell, general manager of Team USA, and of course, the Society for American Baseball Research. Don't forget the first pitch for Olympic baseball is scheduled for July 28th, and Team USA and Team Israel will play each other in their first games. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Big thank you again, and a big round of applause to Matt, Peter, and Eric for sharing their knowledge and their time. So that will do it for this international baseball session. Again, we want to thank our amazing speakers, partners, and all of you for spending your Sunday and Friday and Saturday with us. Don't forget that our Summer of Saber Golden Celebration Series will continue on July 23rd to the 25th with the virtual Jerry Malloy Negro League Conference. As a reminder, your registration includes all the July and August sessions. So we'll see you next month. Take care. <laughs>